Article 1 of the United States Constitution makes clear that the power to declare war lies solely with the legislative branch. The Founders' decision to give this power to Congress was not a random one. They were afraid the presidents would start wars to advance their own political desires and ignore the democratic process. In a letter to Thomas Jefferson, James Madison articulated these very concerns. The executive is the branch of power most interested in war and most prone to it. The Constitution has accordingly vested the question of war in the legislative. However, Congress has not formally declared war since 1942. To anyone living in the present-day United States, this fact may seem startling. Over time, the power to declare war has been commandeered by U.S. presidents who have been eager to work around Congress to achieve their military and political goals. To understand how this trend developed, we must look at the first time a president hijacked the power to go to war. On May 11, 1846, President James Polk sent an address to Congress requesting that they formally declare war on Mexico. In this address, the president argued that war had already begun. He said that it had been started by Mexico and that U.S. soldiers in the area had been under instructions to abstain from all aggressive acts toward Mexico. However, as we will see later in this video, this could not be farther from the truth. Despite both President Polk's dishonesty and heavy criticism from certain congressmen, Congress gave in and retroactively authorized the Mexican-American War. This war would claim the lives of 13,282 Americans. It would cost more than $2.5 billion in 2019 dollars and dominate political discussion throughout its duration. To understand how President Polk was able to undermine the Constitution and instigate war without the consent of Congress, we must understand both the United States' relationship with Mexico and the political reality of the time. The day before President Polk was sworn into office, the United States annexed Texas, meaning that they formally brought it into the United States. Texas had previously seceded from Mexico, but the Mexican government still considered it their territory. The day after annexation, Mexico cut diplomatic ties with the United States. However, at this time, Mexico did not respond militarily to annexation. It was not until Polk sent troops all the way south to the Rio Grande, far further south than Mexico believed Texas extended, that the war became inevitable. Discussing Polk's decision to send troops to the Rio Grande, historian Michael Beschloss writes that the president knew that even should the Mexicans swallow their outrage about statehood for Texas, they were unlikely to accept the American claim that Texas's territory extended all the way south to the Rio Grande. By sending these troops, Polk worked to undermine Congress's authority to declare war. At the time, Congressman Garrett Davis argued that when Polk ordered the army to the Rio Grande, the Mexicans warned that the United States would be deemed to be making war upon Mexico. Senator John Clayton similarly critiqued the president's maneuvers. It was as much an act of aggression on our part as a man's pointing a pistol at another's breast. Congress has not been consulted. Why then would Congress, which even at the time could see that Polk had ignored the U.S. Constitution, approve his war? It came down primarily to two things, politics and racism. Politically, the early years of war are incredibly popular. They distract a democracy from its internal disputes and unite its citizens against a common enemy. To this day, many people see being against war as being against American troops. The second reason was racism. American perceptions of Mexicans worked alongside Polk's lies to create an environment that supported an illegal and unjust war. Historian John Eisenhower writes that, Given the atmosphere of anti-Mexican racism, Mexicans came to be considered less than civilized people, undeserving of the rights generally accorded to Europeans. It is not surprising, therefore, that rationalizing unjust acts against Mexico would become easy. Polk played into this anti-Mexican racism in his address to Congress, in which he repeatedly described the Mexican government as menacing, belligerent, and unfaithful. Why did Polk work so hard to deceive Congress and the American people to create a war with Mexico? The answer seems to be personal ambition. Polk's presidential campaign had been centered around the expansionist movement, which promised to expand American territory. Furthermore, he had promised to serve only one term as president. Both of these promises allowed him to justify bypassing the Constitution to satisfy his personal political goals. It is important to see how these core principles of racism, personal political ambition, and warmongering have worked together throughout American history. These same principles enabled both the Vietnam and Iraq wars with devastating consequences. The most tragic part of this story is that the writers of the Constitution saw this coming and desperately tried to prevent it. However, as Beschloss writes, just a half century into the life of the American Republic, Polk had crushed the founders' hope that their gleaming new country would not indulge in the old world monarch's habit of manufacturing false pretexts for wars they sought for other, more secret reasons.